I'm Mark Turgenti. I'm the lead sales design engineer for Burt Process Equipment. Burt Process Equipment is a manufacturer and supplier of water conditioning and treatment systems. As the lead sales design engineer, I work hand in hand with end users, engineers, and architects in the design of water conditioning treatment systems for both water reclamation systems, high purity water, and wastewater treatments. I have worked on numerous projects around the world for military installations, academic and universities, healthcare, as well as pharmaceuticals, data centers, and colleges and universities. Today in this session, we're going to be discussing the fundamentals of water reclamation systems. We're going to kind of open up talking about why we do water reclamation and then move into system sizing. As you can see here, what we're really going to look at through the course of these sessions is taking the overall system from the roof down through into the storage and treatment from the sinks here is a gray water application as well as from the parking lot and putting it back into the system as a fully treated system. So kind of at the end of these sessions, you, is, you should be able to fully design and integrate one of these systems. I always like to open up with kind of a brief understanding of what we're talking about. So one of the things that comes up a lot when you're doing these types of systems is the nomenclature. What am I talking about and how does it affect what I'm trying to do with this water? So we kind of break it down into three distinct classifications. Most of you are familiar with gray water. Gray water is untreated wastewater that has not come in contact with black water or sewage. This is essentially any water from hand washing to dishwashers to laundry machines that's not been used in any kind of food preparation. Food preparation is classified as dark gray water. And again, the distinction is made based on the perceived level of contamination with the water. In general, in the United States, gray water is generally not used in water reclamation. And part of the reason for that is because it's governed by health codes. And as we talk about a little later, there really isn't a substantial amount of water to justify the system cost for this type of technology. The two we focus on predominantly here in the United States is both reclaimed water and then harvested rainwater. Reclaimed water, which is also identified sometimes as clean or clear water, is water from such devices as HVAC condensate, reverse osmosis reject, fire protection waters, waters that have been used but really have picked up very little if no contamination from these different sources. And then lastly, we have harvested rainwater. Harvested rainwater is broken down into two distinct classifications as well. Rainwater, which is any water which is captured solely from a roof surface, and then stormwater, which is any water precipitation which is captured from any other source, parking lots, streets, pedestrian walkways, fields or agriculture, or even captured, for example, in a pond or in a natural uh, fountain. So why do we do this? There's a couple of different reasons why. 97.5% of all water on Earth is salt water. We only have about 2.5% of all available water is actually fresh water. Of that, majority of it's actually frozen in Antarctica. Here in the United States, there are about 15 states that are actually running out of water. Of that water, actually interesting statistic, a lot of it is actually found in the Great Lakes. Actually, almost 25% almost of all fresh water is actually found in the U.S. Great Lakes. So water conservation is really the major driving force behind, rain, behind developing rainwater system technologies. A lot of people believe that rainwater systems are kind of a new or kind of uh, emerging technology. The truth of the matter is they've actually been around for about 30, 40 years, including in the United States. Areas such as, such as Hawaii have actually been doing rainwater reclamation for quite a long time. It's also been done in the Caribbean as well. So the technology itself is not new. It's mainstream use in commercial building design is what's really an emerging technology, um, sorry, emerging application. And a lot of this is being driven by what's called a LEED in the U.S. Green Building Council. U.S. Green Building Council is developed what's called a LEED, which is the Leadership in Environmental and Energy Design. <laughs> LEED basically grants points for a building both from bronze to platinum for water reduction. And there are numerous points which are available 
for using rainwater or stormwater harvesting. These include 50% reduction of water use, 100% reduction for sewage conveyance, which is also flushing fixtures, and then 50 or 100% reduction for irrigated water use without using a municipal supply. So what we're going to focus on in the rest of this session is really the sizing and then the feasibility of these systems. I will say that in in general, just because you can do a rainwater harvesting or stormwater harvesting system doesn't mean you always should. Feasibility certainly needs to be looked at when discussing these systems. So the first step in designing a system is understanding what your water sources are going to be from, whether it's stormwater, whether it's rainwater, whether you're going to be using gray water, whatever. And then also what you're going to be using the water for. For rain and storm water, sizing is a matter of computation. For all other sources, it's dictated, for all other sources, it's based on empirical data. Sizing rainwater and storm water is done in a very similar manner. It's done, as I said before, as a, as a matter of computation. You utilize, in sizing these systems, the feed of rainwater times the correction factor, which I'll explain in a second, times the catchment area, and then times what's called the runoff coefficient. Feed of, rain, feed of rainwater, rainfall, is determined using typically monthly values. It's very hard to look at rainfall on a daily basis or even a weekly basis. Most of the information which is available is based on monthly data. So you can have, you know, typically you'll see anywhere between four and a half to as low as about one inch of rainfall in the U.S. depending upon where you are in a given month. The catchment surface is calculated based on what you're using, whether it's a roof or a storm or other catchment surface, based on the available area. The 0.65 correction factor is utilized to account for the losses that occur during any precipitation or rainfall event. These include runoff, evaporation, freezing if you're in a cold weather climate, as well as roof-based fixtures which are designed to reduce contaminant loading into your system. The runoff coefficient comes into play during stormwater sizing. And what the runoff coefficient is, is it dictates how much water you can lose based on what your surface area is. For a roof or even a parking lot, this number is generally one. If you're going to be catching off of another surface, such as a sandy beach, for example, which I mean, most people obviously wouldn't do, you would end up with a, you'd end up with a coefficient of about 0.15 because you'd have so much more drainage from that runoff coefficients. It should be noted that you can only catch rainfall off of two sides of any vertical structure during any given precipitation event. So if you have any vertical structures on your roof surface and you're going to utilize them as part of your catchment area, you can only account for about 50% of that overall area. And here I'm showing kind of just a broad spectrum of what the average rainfall is across the United States. As you can see, there is quite a bit of variance. On the eastern seaboard, rainfall is fairly consistent in the 36 to 40 inches, 45 inches per year. It usually breaks down to about four inches a month. As you move out west, you start seeing a lot more variation. Down, down in the southwest and even into western Texas, you see very, very low precipitation events. This could be down as low as 12 to 15 inches over the course of the entire year. And as we move up to the Pacific Northwest, we start seeing like six inches per month which comes in the form of generally 50 to 60 you know, inches per year. How the rainfall also comes in is also determined by the geography. And what I mean by that is the rainfall that we see in the Pacific Northwest doesn't occur the way it occurs in the Northeast or even in the Gulf region as an example. And that does come into play also when designing your system. In the Northeast as an example, we tend to get fairly consistent precipitation events. In the Pacific Northwest, majority of the rain is mist. It's not a heavy rainfall. Misting is very hard to capture overall from a rainwater reclamation standpoint. And then in the Gulf region, majority of the rain comes in very quickly. They have what's called thunder boomers down there, where you can see precipitation events that can go four to five inches an hour of rainfall. 
this is going to largely skew your ability to capture that rainfall. It's going to cause a lot more runoff in those cases. So geography, in addition to what the total rainfall is, does have an overall impact in your system design. For other sources of, for other reclaimed water sources, such as reverse osmosis and HVAC and cooling tower condensate, cooling tower blowdown and gray water, these waters are, these systems are designed based on empirical data. How large your cooling tower is, what's the flow rate of your reverse osmosis system. And just to understand reverse osmosis, these are also include devices like dialysis machines and hospitals are also a source of reverse osmosis reject water. These kind of first two here, reverse osmosis and HVAC and cooling tower condensate, are generally classified, as I said before, as clear water systems. The other two are classified predominantly, including cooling tower blowdown, as more of a gray water source. One note on gray water, because I know a lot of people like to look at this as a potential source for reclaimed water. Gray water tends to, one, it has very high levels of contamination, but also, of all the water that comes into a given commercial building, really only about 3% of it is actually usable as gray water. If you really think about you know, hand washing, for example, which is what you're going to predominantly see in most commercial buildings, the average person washes their hands for about 12 seconds. As a result of all the water coming in, only about 3% actually is usable. So it's a very significantly low number. And as a result of that, it's generally not used, one from a feasibility standpoint, but also because of the high levels of contamination. A lot of times these types of waters are also used in conjunction with rain and storm water. It is worth noting that since rain and storm water reclamation is based on the unpredictability of precipitation events, these other sources of water will tend to dominate your overall collected water source. Because of that, when we get into talk about treatment in a later session, you have to look at those water sources in comparison to the rainwater source. It's also worth noting that when you combine water sources, whatever the worst or most contaminated source of water is, is what ends up becoming your overall body of collected water. There really is no dilution when you're talking about these kinds of systems. Now that we've kind of talked about what your sources of water are, it's also important to review what you're going to be using them for. The three most common uses for reclaimed water are flushing fixtures, irrigations, and cooling towers. Of these three, originally flushing fixtures was kind of the main driving force for these systems. That has a little bit gone away, still one of the major sources of use. The one problem it has is because it's a non-potable water source that you're using, all reclaimed water, kind of regardless of source within the United States, is classified as a non-potable water source. Even if you bring it up to drinking water levels, you generally can't use it for drinking. As a result of that, you need a lot more infrastructure in your overall piping system to utilize rainwater for flushing fixtures. You're gonna end up running a potable source to every sink in that laboratory and then have to run an entirely non-potable source through that as well to your various flushing fixtures. This adds a lot of project cost to the system when utilizing reclaimed water for flushing fixtures. Irrigation and cooling towers have the advantage that you really only have very few connections for use. Irrigation goes out to your irrigation line, cooling tower is typically a single line right to your cooling tower basin. So you're not adding a lot of complexity to your piping structure for utilizing these different water systems. There are a few other uses for reclaimed water in buildings. These include like natural fountains, fire suppression waters, sprinkler systems. These are used to some degree. They're not major uses for this type of water. And as a result, you really don't use them too much in system size. And they tend to be very low overall water uses. One of the things of note is the potable. It should kind of clarify that statement. Commercially, you cannot use reclaimed water for potable use. There are a few states now in the United States, Western Texas, Washington, Oregon, some other, a few other West Coast states, where you are now allowed to use rainwater as a potable water source for residential applications. Doing that changes your overall treatment system, which we'll talk about in a later session. 
but overall in commercial buildings, it's not a viable alternative. And additional treatment steps need to be utilized when, when using potable water, at, when using sort of reclaimed water as a potable water source. Taking a step back here and looking at what your reclaimed water source is and then in comparing it to what your water use is going to be, it helps you determine your water feasibility. But it also is the first step in sizing your storage volume. One of the things that's very critical in reclaimed water, in reclaimed water systems is understanding and sizing a proper storage volume. This is oftentimes referred to as a cistern. Or cistern tank. What you have to look at when sizing a cistern tank is how much water I'm going to use, you know, i.e. irrigation, cooling towers, flushing fixtures, and then comparing it to what my, what my actual reclaimed water sources are, whether that ends up being rainwater, stormwater, or some other water source. Based on how much of that water you get collected, and how much you're using, that differential ultimately becomes your cistern or your storage tank. And that cistern volume can vary considerably from very small, 500 gallons, all the way up to 100 and 200,000 gallon tanks for very large systems. Talking about the cistern for a second, most of them tend to be thermoplastic or fiberglass, concrete, metal, or wood. And these are generally very large tanks. When you're talking about residential rainwater reclamation, people do look at things like 50 gallon rain barrels and devices like that. These types of systems are not really applicable in talking about commercial rainwater applications. There are some benefits and disadvantages to using different types of cistern materials. Thermoplastics are good, they're best for indoor use, but all these tanks, regardless, need to be pigmented. One of the things you absolutely want to do is if the tank is not going to be buried, it needs to be pigmented to prevent bacteria buildup from natural sunlight within, within the storage tank. Fiberglass is very common. There's a lot of fiberglass tanks which have been used. A lot of people, what they've done is they've converted old or the old technology of gasoline fiberglass tanks that were used in gas stations and have turned them now into uh, reclaimed water storage tanks. And they're typically tank farmed anywhere between, again, a couple of thousand gallons up to 50,000 gallon tanks. Concrete and metal you do see just typically tend to be in cities for the most part where they'll actually build these tanks into the building foundation. So either in the concrete or a large stainless steel vessel. I actually worked on a project in New York City where they had constructed a 55,000 gallon 316 stainless steel tank, basically three floors below the street in Manhattan tied right into where the actual subway tracks came into the, into the building. Is it the best application? No, metal can have some, can have some issues. When we talk about water quality in a later session, the acidity of rainwater can really play some, really wreak some havoc on metal tanks, but it is commonly used. In wood, not too common. It is used, it is used in a few different states, Hawaii being one of them. There really is no benefits to it. It can be very expensive to build for large tanks out of wood, but it is commonly used. What they've done is they've converted the old cooling tower potable tanks, which they used to use in large cities, now into reclaimed water storage tanks. Coming back to sizing here for a second, as I said, cistern sizing is based on how much water I can collect and then comparing it to how much water I'm going to actually use. So there really are two schools of thought when it comes to reclaimed water sizing. The minimum size, as also dictated now by the plumbing code, is to size your reclaimed water system for two days of water use, not water collection. So if I am using my water for flushing fixtures and I need 5,000 gallons a day, then my minimum cistern storage tank volume should be 10,000 gallons. The maximum size is to size it for my longest drought period be between precipitation events. So what that means is looking at my rainfall data, which we discussed earlier, if I have 10 to 12 days between average rainfall events, then what you need to do is you want to say you have your same 5,000 gallons of use, you want to size your tank for 50,000 gallons. 
That way you can collect and hold as much rain, much, much rain or storm water as possible. Generally speaking, there's a lot of other factors that come into cistern. This is kind of the academic approach to it, but in reality, available footprints, you know, if you're working in a city, you don't necessarily have room for 100,000 gallon tanks. You have room for 15,000 gallon tanks or 5,000 gallon tanks, and also cost. Putting in hundreds of thousands of gallons of tank storage volume is very expensive. Kind of talking about feasibility for a second, one of the things that does come up quite a bit is when you're looking at these systems is, you know, the, system, the actual reclaimed water system, which we're going to talk about in a later session, it's only really one part of the overall design. You have your storage tanks, you have your piping infrastructure. These are the things that really can drive the cost and make these systems not be feasible for, your, for use within your building, you know, beyond just looking at how much water you can collect and how much water you can actually use. There are some pitfalls, of course, to water design. Making the tank too small will lead you to overflowing most of your rainfall and then you don't actually have the ability to really utilize what you could be is from, from an actual catchment and water use standpoint. Oversizing the system can lead to stagnation. Now you basically have this very large tank full of water that's just going to sit there completely stagnant for use. So there is definitely two schools of thought involved with these different systems. Cistern design, while important for water collection and water sizing, tank sizing, is also important for assisting your downstream treatments and repressurization system. Really, your overall treatment kind of begins within your cistern. So I'm going to touch on that just kind of briefly here quickly before we, the next sessions we're going to talk about really about treatment in general. But your you have a large tank. 1,000, 5,000, 100,000 gallons. Kind of doesn't really matter what your tank is. There are certain configurations that you want to use. One, you want to have level controls in that tank, obviously for monitoring your tank level. A lot of people do use what's called the smoothing inlet. And what a smoothing inlet does is it, during your actual precipitation event, you want to direct your water up, not down into your tank like, like a typical downpipe. This will help prevent the system from basically agitating any debris that enters into your cistern tank. And then lastly, whatever pumps you end up using, you want to make sure that they're solids capable and you generally want to have some kind of filtration within that system or, and this is important for cistern design, you really only want to draw off the middle of the tank. You really want to avoid kind of the bottom 25% of the tank, and you want to avoid the top 10% of the tank. A cistern is like any body of fresh water. The top layer is going to be the most oxidized layer. It's going to have the highest level of bacteria buildup within, this, within your tank. The bottom level is going to be your most reduced level. It's going to be like the bottom of a pond. It's going to have all your debris and sediment in it. And you're drawing off of that, you're going to have lower quality water, and you're also going to have a lot more contamination to deal with. So there's kind of a sweet spot there between really drawing off the middle of the tank, kind of that middle 70%. So when you're looking at your cistern sizing, you really want to use that 70% as your volume for use. Kind of moving away from the cistern, what we're going to end off this session looking at is we're going to utilize these tools we've covered for sizing both the available rainfall as well as my water use, and we're going to compare that to see the overall feasibility of the system. So I'm going to kind of walk through here an example of rainwater system sizing. So this is just an example. This is a real building. Uh, it's a small corporate headquarters located in Connecticut. The average monthly rainfall in Connecticut, which is actually where I'm from, is very level. We have about four inches of rainfall every month, except in February where we get 40 inches of snow every month. <laughs> We're going to calculate the collection area. We're going to use this water for both flushing fixtures and irrigation. And all of our plants, I'm going to talk about this just kind of quickly here, um, are low water use plants. I'm going to show you how you can, in general, calculate your irrigation water demand. Irrigation is often calculated you know, by an irrigation designer, but this is kind of a, a simple approach to calculating irrigation water use. So let's kind of move into the problem now. So the first thing you want to do is size your catchment surface. So catchment surface in this case is roof only. 
and the building is about 200 feet to a small vertical rise. It's 100 feet deep, that vertical rise is 40 feet, and that top section there is about 100 feet, 100 foot square. So looking at my horizontal surface areas, I have 200 feet times 100 feet for that lower level, and then 100 feet times 100 feet for that upper level, which gives me a horizontal surface area of approximately 30,000 square feet. My vertical surface area is 40 feet by then the 100 feet across, across depth times my loss factor. So I have about 8,000 square feet of vertical catchment surface. So my total collection area is approximately 38,000 square feet. Bringing us back to the equation I discussed earlier in the session, feet of rainfall times my loss factor times the catchment area times the runoff coefficient, I have 38,000 square feet. I have four inches of rainfall or approximately 0.33 or one third of a foot. I have a runoff coefficient in this case, I'm utilizing a 0.9. I'm being kind of conservative here in my sizing. And then I have, a, and then I have my loss factor of 0.65. Calculating that through, my total available water is approximately 45,000 gallons per month. So that's about an average size collection for a small commercial building like this. I'm going to show you briefly here the irrigation demand. And what that is is you take what's called the evapotranspiration times the plant factor times the irrigated area. So what is evapotranspiration? Evapotranspiration is a number which takes into account the plant absorption rate in comparison to the evaporation rate of water from the plant. Actually, it's a collection factor of how your plant basically absorbs precipitation. So that also varies from climate, relative humidity. So it does depend a lot on where you are, um, but for, Right now, the evapotranspiration rate in Connecticut is approximately two feet. It's always a measurement in feet, as an example. The plan factor in this case is a low water use. These usually go 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, all the way up to 0 0.8. There really is no one for a plant use coefficient. So 0 0.2 means it's like grass, um, maybe some evergreen trees, things like that. If you're talking about like tropical plants, now you're at 0 0.6, 0 0.8. So what, what your plants are is what dictates that plant use coefficient. And then my irrigated area, which I calculate, which I'm showing here, is 300 feet times approximately a five foot area. Multiplying that together, I get approximately 1,500 feet times my 0 0.2 plant co coefficient times my evapotranspiration rate of two feet, then I'm utilizing about 4,500 gallons per month for irrigation. So I still got quite a bit of water to play with. The next step I want to do is, is size my flushing fixture demand. And flushing fixture demand is size how you would size it if you were designing it for a potable water source. You look at what the building occupancy is, as well as transient occupancy, if that's, a, if, that's, if that's a substantial number, and you look at what your water fixture count, what your water fixtures are. So in this case, I'm not using particularly low, low water use fixtures. I'm using 1.28 gallons per flush per toilet and 0 0.5 gallons per flush for urinals. So average use is three times per day in an eight hour period. For a male, it's two urinals and one toilet use per day. For a female, it's three toilet uses per day. Yes, women do use more water than men. So the male use would be 200 times 1.28 plus 200 times 0 0.5, which is the urinal use, times two or 456 gallons per day based on 200 male occupancy. For females, it's 200 times 1.28 times three or 768 gallons per day. So my total water use for flushing fixtures is 1,224 gallons per day. Next step, I'm going to, the next step is to compare my demand, which is what I just calculated for both my irrigation and my flushing fixtures, to my collectible rainfall. So in this case, I have 45,000 gallons per month I'm going to collect on average for rainfall, and I have 1,224 gallons per day with a 30-day occupancy. For flushing fixtures, that gives me 36,720 gallons per month. 
for irrigation use, I have 4,500 gallons per month. So I have a total water demand of 41,220 gallons. So comparing this, I have 45,000 gallons available and I'm utilizing 41,220. So I have almost, basically almost using 100%, about 90% about of my water use, collectible water is being used in the system. So I have about 3,700 gallons more for further use. But again, the 45,000 gallons is an average, so you're gonna see some highs and lows off of that. So I'm gonna have about 100% overall water reduction simply by using rainfall. This is obviously a fantastic situation. Generally speaking, what you're shooting for is gonna be approximately 50% reduction in water use overall from your system. So if, if for example, my water use in the building was 90,000 gallons, I collected 45,000 gallons, that's still a pretty feasible system. And this will vary month to month, which I'll show you guys in a couple of minutes here. But in general, 50% or better is kind of what you're targeting. What you'll find a lot of times is if you have very high water uses like cooling towers or very high irrigation demand, generally flushing fixtures is fairly consistent within your building. You can see that number vary quite a bit. You can see that number go as high as 80 and then go down as low as 10%. Particularly with cooling towers in the summer where your water use can become very, very high. If you're consistently looking at your system on a month by month basis and you're seeing 10, 15, 20%, your system is not as feasible. And in, in rainwater reclamation in that case may not be your best alternative for water reduction. Looking at my cistern sizing, I'm gonna size it based on my longest drought period, which in this area is about 10 days. So looking again at my flushing fixtures of 1,224 gallons per day, my total irrigated area of 4,500 gallons per month, Dividing that out, I need about 150 gallons per day for irrigation. So I add that to my 1,224 gallons times my 10 days. I need about a 13,740 gallon cistern, which makes sense. I'm going to get about four precipitation events per month at about 15,000 gallons to fill up my 45,000 gallons of collectible rainwater use. To kind of summarize this section here, your first step in system sizing is to determine your rain catchment area and what that's going to be. Your second step is to determine your available rainwater. That's, that's the calculation we were looking at before. Month of, month of rainfall times my loss factor, times my runoff coefficient, times the catchment area. The next step is to determine your irrigation demand if applicable, determine your flushing fixture demand if applicable, or whatever your other uses are, cooling towers, et cetera. Compare available and demand requirements for system feasibility. Again, you want 50% or better on average, and then size your cistern in that case. What I have here is, obviously that's a very simplified approach to this, but looking at a water reclaim system, in general, you want to do that same kind of calculation on a month by month basis, because your rainfall is going to vary. It's not always going to be four inches, it's going to be 3.9, 4.5, 3.8, etc. You're also going to have other factors like cooling towers, which are going to come into the system at different points. It's going to be usable only from, say, May to August or May to September. I'm only irrigating from, say, April to October. So your water rate is going to vary much more than what I'm showing in this simple example here. Your flushing fixtures will be consistent, but you're gonna see a lot of highs and lows in your overall water use. And when you actually need the water the most in July, may be your drought season. So it's important when really looking at these systems, look at every month specifically. To recap, what we discussed was an introduction into rainwater basics. We covered the definitions of both rainwater, stormwater, clean and clear water and also gray water. We looked at sizing your collection surface, sizing your rain and storm water catchment, as well as your other water sources from, from an empirical standpoint. We also looked at how to size your water use, flushing fixtures, irrigation, cooling tower, and other demands. We went through a very simple problem kind of sh showing this, comparing my water use to my water demand. And then we concluded talking about the feasibility of the system, which in general is about 50% you want to target differential between your water demand and your, uh, and your, water, um, your captured rainwater. 
And the second part, what we're going to look at is what is in my water. We talked a lot about rainwater and gray water in general. We're going to do an in-depth look into what these waters have, what the characteristics are, as well as how you treat these different waters for use for these different applications.